Good afternoon. So I want to talk about a little bit, a little bit about how to be an activist. When I was born, my mother said that I was a fighter. However, I came to think of myself as someone who would become an activist. So when I came to college, this really cool thing happened. I started collecting all these really crazy women who would end up being some of the best women that I would come to know, and they became my activist dream team. I'm talking about now they're optometrists, engineers, social workers, they're all doctors, PhDs, MDs, dentists, veterinarians. In fact, I left college with the best wraparound care ever. <laughs> so something that I also learned by doing that is that you cannot grow in isolation. And if you could think about what I just said in the list of all their credentials, they're all in very different majors, right? Different disciplines. And that diversity, not just racial or ethnic diversity, but that even that academic discipline helped me grow. So what I've learned about growing is that if you, if you isolate yourself and try to do things by yourself, you're not gonna grow. And the research shows that's true. At the University of Chicago, there are two really cool dudes in neuroscience and social cognitive behavior stuff that I don't get into, but I read their study. And they said that 20% of Americans, that's 60 million people, experience chronic loneliness. That's a lot of people, right? So if we were kind of look at the crowd, it would be a lot of you in here who are experiencing chronic loneliness. And I knew that was not for me, and I also knew that you're not gonna move mountains if you're just gonna be putting yourself in lonely positions. And so I left with the dream team, and that's where I wanted to start with. See some of them there. Right. So I found out that if you write things down, people may read them. <laughs> so I wrote, I decided to write a column with our school newspaper with a friend who's Dr. Diane, now OBGYN, part of the academic dream team. And we wrote our senior year. And what we learned was that people actually read this. And some of y'all know what this is. This is a school newspaper. And what happened with the crazy thing of the internet is that people from all over the country and possibly the world might read what you wrote. Well, we decided that we wanted to write about social issues of the time that are actually pretty salient right now. Police profiling, which is this article here, and women's bodies being politicized, even government issues. Well, what happens when we wrote this particular piece, there's some dude from Virginia who, some of y'all might be from Virginia, no hate, uh, but there's, some, there's this dude from Virginia who actually took the time to write us a hate letter that threatened our lives. And for me, that was so crazy, because you know if you work at a math problem or you write a paper, no one's gonna say, I wanna kill you, right? You may feel like dying, but no one wants to kill you. And, and, what, and what we really learned from that, you know, at the expire age of 21, 22, is that you have to get behind what you believe and what are you willing to die for? Is there issues that you're willing to put your life on the line? That's really some of the elements of activism. Is, are there issues, whether it be childcare, whether it be literacy, what are the things that you're really passionate about? And we were really passionate about these issues and we kept writing, we kept writing. And now, you know, she's, Dr. Diane is actually one of the best universe, uh, University of Minnesota hospital OBGYNs, and she's in a magazine, so she's really fancy now. So another group that I actually direct is called Buckeye Reach. And Buckeye Reach is an education-based program that's at multiple prison institutions, mostly serving incarcerated youth. So what happens is now there's 100 uh, staff, faculty, and students who are trained by my elite team, who are here, and they get to go in and work with these youth. Now, sometimes you're trying to figure out, what does this go with the pen? Well, one of the elements of the program is that we're not there every day, so we really want to cultivate relationships and work on things like literacy, et cetera, with the youth that we work with. So there's this really cool pen pal program. And some of you are thinking, pen pal seems very archaic. But what we know from the literature that talks about what it means to be a pen pal is that writing with the incarcerated youth increases self-efficacy, so that's that feeling of well-being that you matter to the world. It decreases isolation 
and loneliness. And it also increases things like critical thinking skills and seeing that the world is bigger than their own situation. And it builds that relationship between that mentor and the incarcerated youth. What we came to find out, again, is that the pen is a form of activism, and it's very strong. So something else that I learned in the road along the way of activism is that you got to use your voice, right? Like I'm using my voice now, keeping it fresh. And, and so what I've learned um, really started early. So I came to Ohio State, I was 19 years old, 18, 19 years old, and I took this class with Dr. Elizabeth Allen, who is now at the University of Maine. But I took this class from her, and she just blew my mind. She rocked my world. She turned me into such a badass, you see before you. And what she did was that she gave me this sort of academic arsenal. She, you know, I just became hashtag academic swagger. Like, it was just so great. And then what she did was like, okay, you guys have all this knowledge. Like, what are you going to do with it? And like most college students, they moved on and were like, whatever. I was just so enraged and so on fire. I was like, yeah, I'm down to do whatever, right? So we got together, formed this sort of group called Peer Power. And Peer Power became an opportunity for me to get on my first grant. So at, eight, so at 18, I was writing on my first grant. I then learned to develop curriculum, which is some of you who are going to graduate school or think about curriculum design. That's something that you learn later on. So learn to develop curriculum, then learn to actually present that curriculum in a really cool form, and then you could teach other people how to also present and do things that are innovative. And so we taught people about systems of inequality, other types of injustice, things around education, and it was such a release for me. What she did was she helped me develop my voice, right? So I had worked on the pen, I really wrote passionately, but I didn't really realize that people would actually listen to some of the things that I had to say. And now, I don't shut up. <laughs> so what you have to do is get in front of people with your message, right? After you sort of crafted what you do, you get in front of people and then you realize something very, very important is that you can't allow other people to get in the way of your education and you should become a lifelong learner. You don't stop learning because you graduate high school or you go to college or you're MD, PhD, engineer, social worker, et cetera, right? You're still learning and then you become of something, part of something bigger than yourself and you're able to join other people and your pen and voice start to matter and then you make some real change. So something else that I thought was really beautiful is that I, ended up um, finding out that I just didn't want to stop with my voice and my pen. And so I read this really great book called Bowling Alone. It deals with isolation and the fact the gross individualization of Americans, which is to no surprise. What, what, some of the things that I started to glean was like, you know, we see the bystander effect, we see all these things happening to people, and you see me, I'm digging myself out of snow, no one helps. And so you realize that, that people are really disconnected. And so activism comes into play when you're able to use it differently. So when I was born, my family was homeless. And what that means is that you're less likely to finish high school, you're less likely to go, go to college, and what we know is that 70% of Americans have high school degrees, so that 30% of the folks are really grossly undereducated. But it's to no surprise that college students typically will complain about really meaningless things like, how much food they waste and what doesn't taste good on campus. And so what about when we juxtapose that when one of four children in Ohio are hungry? There's a lot of issues that we need to get behind. That's me and my mom. That's just from my mom. <laughs> so performance became something really important to me. And right, hey, I got to love my mom. So something that was really important to me uh, is that I fell into this thing called the vagina monologues. The Vagina Monologues, it's all about performance, but it's about a greater picture. Eve Ensler created the Vagina Monologues, and it was really a testimony of how to get a concert of women together around a really particular issue that's affecting so many people, ending violence against women. I thought to myself, okay, this is a great project for me to get behind. It's my senior year, it's something really big, I ended up doing it for six years, but at the beginning I was very scared. I was scared because I never said the word vagina in front of hundreds of people before. And so now I'm like, vagina, vagina, vagina. But, 
But I thought, you know, how, how could this really work? How could this really mobilize people? And to kind of stand in front of you and think about the one billion women rising around the world to end violence against women and that I'm part of this concert that is bigger than myself and that these small group of people can change the world. What I learned was that service was not about me. It was about other people. And that Marion Wright Elderman in her book, the, the, she says that services are meant for, for, for living. And what I learned is that we are born with this debt that we have to give back, that we have to know that just because we exist, we need to kind of give back in a way that's meaningful for other people. That is why we exist. That is why we need to connect with people and work with others. That's right. So what I learned from the Jordan monologues is that the audience turned into activists. We had fraternity guys coming to do diversity requirements and you know, leaving really enlightened. We had grandparents who were coming in to see their granddaughters and they left with stories to talk about at bingo and that seemed just really radical. And then you know, we had residence hall folks just pour in and pour out thinking about concepts that were different than what they've ever heard before. We created an audience of activists just by our performance. What are you gonna do to change the world? How are you gonna find the pen, the voice, the performance, the way of stepping out that's different, that's uniquely yours? That is something that you should be thinking about every day. Activism is a way to find community. You don't have to live in isolation. And we know the data supports it, that you thrive, you're healthier, you live longer when you're in community. So might as well do activism and do it together, hey. <laughs> Right. So I just wanted to leave you with just this simple thought, that in all this time that I, my journey to become an activist, in all this time, I really changed. But I hope to leave you with this thought that you can change too. Thank you.